like to introduce our, our special guest today, the legendary Jonathan Nelson. Jonathan Nelson is the founder and executive chairman of Providence, which is a $45 billion asset manager based in Rhode Island. Jonathan also serves as the chairman uh, of the uh, Ambassador Theora Group and the director of the Chernin Group, on top of which he has served as a uh, director of numerous media and telecom companies such as Hulu, Metronet, which is now part of AT&T Canada, MLS uh, Media, Univision, Voice Stream, Warner Music Group, um, uh, Yankees Entertainment and Sports Network, and on and on. Um, Jonathan has been a private equity investor for nearly 40 years. And prior to founding Providence in, in 89, he was the managing director of Naringset Capital, where he specialized in private equity investments in media. Jonathan has degrees from Harvard Business School and Brown University and is actively engaged, I should say, is an actively engaged philanthropist with both of his alma maters. He's a trustee at Brown University, the Rockefeller University, and Institute for Advanced Study. And he's a member of uh, the board of Dean's Advisors at Harvard Business School, where he's the recipient of Harvard's highest honor bestowed upon the school uh, upon its graduates. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Mr. Jonathan Nelson. Jonathan, thank you for joining us. Uh, Mo, it's uh, nice to see you uh, as best we can uh, uh, virtually and to join um, uh, everyone for, for lunch, I'm assuming based on the hour and the title lunch. Actually, uh, I hope at least half of that is true, but I'm not sure I, I can't do much about uh, the lunch or the legend part, but um, time will tell. Yeah. Well, listen, we're delighted to have you. So let's just to get started, could I ask you just to share a little bit about your background and maybe uh, what you would consider some of the most formative experiences uh, that kind of brought you to this point? Gosh, well, um, sort of, I think of my life, I, I don't spend a lot of time looking back, but because um, I'm always looking ahead, but I had a, uh, uh, for what I would consider a great start, which revolved around education and family. And my first real job was in, uh, when I graduated from, uh, from Brown, 1977, I went to China and mm -hmm. I spent the better part of three and a half years there, which in that time period, that was remarkable because that was before uh, there were diplomatic relations between the U.S. and China. It was very early days for, um, not in China's history, but the history that most people are familiar with, which is their uh, incredible uh, economic growth and development in so many ways. Uh, and so that was uh, life-changing for me. Uh, then I moved to Sweden. I was um, not quite ready to move back to the U.S., but... Um, um, I met my future wife uh, uh, during the time I was working in China, so I needed to learn Swedish and live in Sweden, which accomplished both those things. Went to business school, and amazingly to me, uh, that my first job was in what we now call private equity, Narragansett Capital, uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, which um, is actually where I was born. So that that that's. So as I would say the big experiences were the power of education, uh, importance of family, uh, that first job. I mean, everyone remembers that like it's their rookie year, whether it's at the company they're at now or wherever they started. And for me, that was China. It's, it's, uh, the, it has gone full circle. They're now important investors in Providence. And um, there's a strong connection there. I am in Chinese and old friend. And so it's, um, uh, that's uh, gratifying. Um, and that I happened to pick something that um, the, my passion endured and turned out to be a pretty good industry to be. And, and so let me just double click on China for a minute. You know, again, you went there in the early 80s. How, how did that experience specifically shape your worldview? Well, we're very impressed. You know, I was very young when I got out of college, uh, <laughs> younger than average. And so, and I had never been outside the US 
not, I mean, uh, or certainly I shouldn't, I had not been outside of North America. And so going to China was an extreme move. And I learned a lot about people, cultures, business, all at once. I was drinking from a fire hose. I was so young and like a sponge. And I had way too much responsibility than I ever should have. I, I, I don't think I was reckless with it, but my gosh, that, you know, it, I manage other people's money. I would never do that. <laughs> uh, and, but I learned a lot. And back then, you know, this is before mobile phones, before internet, before all that stuff. So I'd be working there and out of contact with everyone for typically a week at a time. I'd have to make a reservation in a, uh, in a um, uh, phone booth. It was actually a big the Chinese PPT to make a call. So I'd have to book it in advance, sit in a booth and call someone. And that was it. And it was never um, about uh, connecting with friends. It was uh, probably home office every time, maybe a client. And that was it. Um, and I might have had two a week and not to the same party. So that's, I would call that not much contact. Uh, and to, and so I learned, but by the way, I learned about myths and truths. People told me, oh, that, that Chinese to most Americans were a mystery and seemed, in, you know, inscrutable was an adjective I heard a lot. I, I found it to be just the opposite. Uh, they were literal with, and um, we could uh, understand one another. And it was fundamentally about business and a mutually beneficial arrangement, which is probably the best kind, you know, that it's not I win, you lose, but we both benefit. I really learned a lot how business really works. I spent a lot of time in Hong Kong, which is even to the, it, it, then more capitalistic than I would say the US and Canada. Hmm. Um, and also I think living outside my home country was a huge benefit to me because it's the only way to have perspective is you need a little distance, typically distance and time. For me, that was more distance than anything. And when I re-entered the US, it was, that was actually a big shock too, um, because business is different. And, um, and I felt like I grew up, the, my formative years in business were spent in Asia. Mm -hmm. And what a great experience. By the way, I took the job, not because I, was, I thought it was a, a career path move. It was literally my first interview when I, when I was a senior in college. And I was trying to get one interview under my belt before it really counted. Uh, I got up early, which was a shocking event by itself to me in those days, and uh, went up to Boston, which was the parent company, and met with the CEO. I had never even met a CEO then. And in fact, I think I spent half the interview just like so impressed by the boardroom table and all the accessories. I'd never been in an office environment like that. And I said to him, do you want grades and recommendations? He said, no, I didn't know then that he was such a classic entrepreneur. He never graduated, never finished college. He told me later he was just looking for a certain person, uh, you know, certain qualities. He didn't never define them, but being an entrepreneur, I could only guess especially one who didn't finish college. So my background academically might not have been that interesting to him. Uh, and he had an idea about building a business in China. And so that was my job was to develop a business there, which is an, I was an unlikely pick because what did I know? Uh, but it worked out. And so you were, you're this rising star at Naring Sect Capital and it's going well for you. What led you, like, how did it, how did you launch Providence? Like, what, what was the driving force behind that? Well, the, um, when I landed the job, which I felt this was a business school and private equity was not well known. I sent a bunch of letters out, mostly didn't hear back. And um, for medical reasons, I couldn't be in New York. And you, you want to eliminate New York, particularly in 1980. Three, um, 
not, they're only, you can count on two hands the number of, what, then they were called buyout shops. Uh, there weren't many, there were so few, and I just eliminated them with a, you know, doctor slip. That, that was a problem. Narragansett hired me and I thought, okay, I'm really lucky. It was a coincidence that it was my, where I was from. That was not, the, certainly not the plan. And it was a successful firm. And I became a partner early. Hmm. Footnote, the first deal I did was to buy the, to buy the company I worked for, the only company I knew, which was the company that sent me to China. They had a very different business, which I thought was remarkable and had some insights having worked there. And um, what I saw when I became a partner a few years after getting there was that I had doubts about whether it was going to work as good as it was for me, because it was a partnership that wasn't based on shared values. And from, it was a, a, an outcome of um, just uh, a bunch of historical events. We didn't choose each other. And well, they chose me, but I didn't have anything to do with the creation of the group. And I thought that what I really wanted to do was start a business, which is a crazy notion because I was so young. And I met, you know, I became a partner. So what more could you want? And I realized then, and, and this is off and on occurred to me when I'm asked in a setting like this, that it must have been more than financially doing well or a title because I was willing to throw all of that out the window to start a firm just because I wanted a different corporate culture. And I had this thought that to do really well, we can't just be opportunistic and do any deal that comes along that we happen to like but rather there'd be a benefit of specializing in a set of industries. And, and that, those two things, culture and, and specialization uh, was what drove me to, and, and maybe deep down there was something about building some, creating something because right. that seemed to become later a pattern. So let, let's go a little deeper on that. You introduced um, uh, um, sort of a media sector focus to leverage bios to the private equity world. Like uh, we'll talk about some of the other things, but could you just talk to that along with any other distinguishing aspects of Providence that you sort of built into the organization um, that really distinguished you in the market? So when I, I had been doing, making media investments at Narragansett. And one of the reasons that I felt compelled by the way to start a business was we were really at our limit. There was concentration limit by industry and fund. And because of the success I was having, it was as high, it was 50%, which is really high. And um, so I said, all right, I'm not gonna wait around nor kind of do industrial deals or something. I'll just start a, a new fund, a new company. And what was driving me was that I thought it's like, it, this was, a really like sports, like medicine. If you wanna be great at something, you have to focus. And let's forget for a minute about little kids focusing very early on some sports so they can be successful. I'm not a believer in that. But if you wanna make a living at something in uh, European football, American football, baseball, um, hockey, maybe I should have started with hockey. Uh, <laughs> you better focus on that. Otherwise you have no chance of succeeding at the highest level. And I thought business was no different. If we're gonna be really good at media, and then it was, didn't include telecom in the early days, didn't include software, didn't include education, a whole bunch of verticals we added over time. It was really narrowly, it was cable TV, um, newspapers, radio, and television, that was it. And I thought to do, to be really good at something, you should focus on it, just like the rest of the world, well, as we know it. And you'll, you should be better able to wean out the bad deals. 
and figure out what deals is there really upside, who's really a good manager, leverage your knowledge. And now that only works if you believe in the underlying industry and believe that there'll be a large enough universe of deals to do. In other words, to become a specialist in a business, even a good business, and there are only two other companies in the business and the likelihood that any one of them will be for available to buy in a year is less than 10%. Well, that doesn't sound like a really worthwhile, at least in terms of career or business specialization. So I needed the expectation of lots of deals. Cable television was fragmented by back then. There were hundreds of cable TV companies and we did dozens of deals. In mobile, mobile was fragmented. We did 25 deals and one company alone buying up mobile. And so it was about domain expertise, leveraging that. And for me, uh, I started with areas that I felt passionate about, which was uh, media. And it wasn't just, oh, I like it. But by the way, I didn't watch TV that much. So that's, that's not it. I'm not saying that. And I didn't sit around listening to music all day. That's not it. But it resonated with me that it was something that was important to a, arguably the widest swath of people. And it mattered. And you could tell, I mean, it's an interesting topic. I hope it is. I can't see all of our, uh, our the guests who are quietly eating lunch perhaps right now. But everyone cares about entertainment and media, whether it's for news, whether it's information, whether it's sports, just broad-based entertainment, it matters. It, it, it actually, um, you know, what we're seeing in this environment, how much people miss it right? and how much of a lifesaver it is on the other hand. Yeah, and I, I, I wanna actually go uh, deeper into media, but before we do, I just wanna zero in on something you said. Um, you talked a bit, uh, the uh, the telecoms uh, and you talked to um, the, the, the I'm sorry the mobile players and and the cable companies that you know you've sort of done multiple acquisitions so and I've also heard you speak about you know platform building capacities or platform strategies how is that central to how you think about value creation yeah interestingly we were doing that before it had a name before people started talking about platforms and tuck-ins and add-ons and we were doing that. Uh, here's an, a good example. It was a company called Western Wireless. John Stanton was the CEO and his wife, Terry, were the founders. And by the way, it's a good thing I didn't have a policy as a young company of never backing a husband and wife team, which sounds like a very good idea, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Except we, if we had such a policy, we wouldn't have done this deal and, and that among a few others, really put us on the map. Right. What that what it, John had essentially run what was Macaw Cellular that we now that became AT and T Cellular nationwide. Um, and I thought, okay, John has the big picture and the small picture. He knows how to build add-on acquisitions. We were buying rural, mobile, really mom and pop operations. We probably did over 20 in the first year, hoovering them up bit by bit, buying them at, this will sound familiar to today, to 2021, um, at low, much lower prices than the large deals, which were typically big markets. Um, and I, I actually still remember the numbers. It was based on per pop then we were less than 10% of the value per pop what we were buying in rural areas compared to every major market like Toronto and, and others. Back then it was 300 and we were buying them for less than 20 bucks a pop. And people said, well, you know, farmers or rural territory, you know, they don't need cellular. Actually, no, that's just a bias of Wall Street because they can't imagine anyone else not sitting in a trading floor actually needs these same tools arguably they need it more because right. they're so far from a telephone and they need to know pricing and, and props and timing and weather and all that stuff. And the phone back then it was voice only. So 
It wasn't valued by Wall Street, but the idea was to aggregate enough of these small deals so that we could replicate the economics of a major market by consolidating call centers. So this was, we got to be really good at this. Um, and it was a huge winner for us. In fact, with the same CEO, which was another pattern, backing entrepreneurs multiple times, mm -hmm. as long as they still had the drive. Right. Um, and we did it with what was, what is, is now cellular was digital. It's called PCS originally. We, we launched the first market in the US. It was actually Hawaii that was digital, that wasn't analog. We went toe to toe with all the big phone companies buying Spectrum. So we literally built it from the ground up. We, we didn't have a single customer. We had, we had four or five employees. Um, we started with tutorials on what um, digital, this was at our little board meeting, you know, what the power would be. We decided not to go for the delayed tax advantaged entrepreneurs block, which is what everyone thought. No, we went right against the big guys, buying Spectrum and eventually built a nationwide company. It's called T-Mobile now. That was us, our, the little engine that could. Mm -hmm. But it was all based on really knowing what you're doing and focusing. So for us, it was the most important thing we were doing. And for some other company, just the same way it was in cable, it was a small market, it didn't matter to them and right. they had bigger fish to fry. Fascinating. So now, you know, fast forward to today, you know, you've done incredible work in aggregate of, of both preserving capital and really delivering attractive net returns to investors. I think somewhere in the range of third, I think it's 26% across all of your funds. So by all accounts, really wonderful success story. And we also know that everyone that makes some mistakes along the way. And I was just wondering, what would you consider your most valuable and enlightening mistakes that you ever made and how they shaped who you so, are today? So I, first, anyone who says they didn't make a mistake, beware, either, either because they're not telling you the whole story or wow, there's a big mistake around the corner coming, mm -hmm. as everyone does. And honestly, I've learned more from mistakes than success. Success, you tend to think, oh, I got this right. I, we've got this nailed. Or worse, we're, we're smart, smarter than, you know, the, the competitor, which I right. would never assume that. Uh, some of it, so, so in the early years, we literally had funds without a single company that lost money, you know, that we lost, you know, our money, which, you know, you don't expect that. And, um, and then we, in um, a period of rapid growth, we made mistakes, there's no question about it. And it, they, and what I learned was, first it was about people. People, it's always people. And in that case, um, we're in an unusual business. It takes a long time to figure out who's really good at it because doing a deal is, doesn't mean you're good, a good investor getting out successfully is the beginning of figuring out your good, but depending on the timing, everyone looks good in different periods. Mm -hmm. You really need a longer period. And so, and we are forced in this business um, to rely on, on a whole chain of people. And so you really need to know one another well. And when you're growing quickly, that's not possible. So one was around people, and we really need to need it to be, and that that's my responsibility to if someone's not repeatedly good at something, you have to make a move on that. Um, or not put them in a position of trust because they haven't learned all the lessons. So that was a, a big lesson for me. This business is not like the hedge fund business, which is um, scalable. No, because the limitation is really about people. And the second learning was about process. We had processes then that worked very well when we were smaller and I could learn everything in the hallway, conversation, hey Mo, what's going on with this company, with that, and we still do a lot of that. Um, and we're very collegial that way. Um, but the processes hadn't caught up to 
the amount of money under management. Mm -hmm. And we fixed that. We changed a number, we changed some people, which is the, what we need to do. As one CEO in a very different industry, when I told him how low turnover was, he said, his response was, that's too low. It's impossible that everyone you've hired, not just you, but the firm is great. I don't believe that. Hmm. And he's right. That, that applies to any firm. And it could be fit. I'm not saying they're, they're all good people. They're all super smart. But there's a very specific skill. And it takes a while for it to be revealed. That's the tough part about this industry. Um, right. And then processes, which have continued. I would say that sort of the joke was on me when I started Providence. It was small. The first fund was $171 million. Actually, there was a certain Canadian investor. Well, I only had seven investors in the first fund. I think I reached out to 400 prospects and landed only seven. I was without any one of them. I wouldn't be a guest in your in your lineup. And uh, you know that fund. They took an enormous bet on us. Was their top fund. Um, that year across that vintage, it's always done by vintage classes, you know, their top fund. And how would they know that we would have succeeded? When I was raising that fund, I didn't have a name. I mean, other than my name, like, there was no firm name, not much of a record. And there was, um, you know, who were we? So I'm so grateful to everyone who supported us originally. I know them by name. I have, a, you know, most of them are still with us which is wonderful all these years later. Um, yeah, so those, and then since then, I must say over the last 10 years, we're back to the first, the success of the first four funds. Um, and that's about just being learning, saying, okay, we got this wrong. It wasn't just the environment. It wasn't just, you know, what happened uh, with the great financial crisis. It would have been too easy to pass that off. No. We should have sold some businesses earlier. We stayed too long. You know, we need to monetize more regularly. We need to have better processes around um, diligence and um, information flow. We fixed that. And now it's been for several funds now, back to the old days. Right, which is great. So let's, let's come back to um, uh, the topic of media. Could you just frame for us how you think about the media landscape today and perhaps how the past year has affected your philosophy or thesis or approach to uh, investing in media? Okay, great question. Um, try and be quick about this. So, uh, and COVID affects perspective on just about everything. Right. So let's start with <laughs> right, the framework. So let me just back up. Yeah, back yeah, yeah. Up. Please. Number one, media, uh, and it may, it's probably true of other industries, but I'm not an expert at other, in other verticals, but media and to some extent telecom, but especially media, has the idea that it is changing significantly is not, everyone thinks in the moment that this has never happened before, something like this, streaming. Isn't that mind boggling? You can binge on whatever you want, whenever you want. Yeah. And people are blown away by that. Well, every decade that I've looked at, not just the ones I've been in business, there are four of those, but before I had any idea what the business of television was, when I first saw a TV, black and white, I remember when my parents got color. Well, before that, we went to a neighbor's to see color. And that was, that was mind blowing <laughs> that when you go, when you look at the history, there have always been amazing um, evolutions. Sometimes it was technology driven, often. Sometimes it was uh, based on regulation. Uh, other times changing consumer behavior. Those would be the top three. Technology has always played a big role. Uh, so is the FCC for example, in the US. And similarly, Canada has a, a set of, of um, uh, a, a regulatory body that governs this. 
So um, the idea of change, I always embraced as a, basically I see us as little guys. We manage $45 billion now and commitments under management. That still makes us small. And so we need to dance around the feet of these big elephants. Well, if it weren't for these incredible changes and upheaval and reshuffling the deck with new cards and some old ones, we'd have no chance. In other words, the incumbents would always have uh, be in a dominant position. And the idea that someone small could start Hulu from scratch or a mobile telephone company from scratch would never happen. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Of course, I'm saying that because that's worked out really well for our investors. Right. Right. And I think it's worked out really well for consumers. Every change pretty, that I can think of, then it, the consumer was the true winner. And that's, that's actually why it worked. It was a better proposition, whether it was, whether it was uh, the breadth of the content, the cost of it, the ease of it, um, all of that, or some combination, consumer won. So that's the history. Now, bringing it to where we are today, what's really interesting to me about the changes we're seeing in television, which is like the, the big one in media, um, you have that and then social media. Those are the two giants um, in search, really, but that's a hybrid. Um, I don't think, contrary to popular view, that what we're witnessing now over the last couple of years with streaming is about technology. People say, no, 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 that you can stream it. Actually, um, networks have been there to stream a channel for some time now. We called it video on demand not long ago. What is really going on is a shift in consumer behavior that companies saw the gaping hole um, for such a product. And the reason the hole existed, it was that void was created by the persistence of incumbents to hang on to a model that fundamentally didn't make sense, which centered on the bundle. Cable companies packaging an increasing number of channels that most people never watched and you had to get all of it. So it's really, I think, the death of linear channels is more what's going on than streaming. And streaming is just, they got it faster than others about how people actually want to consume given a chance. They don't want someone to program for them. They want to, they don't care about 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 11. It's whenever they want, as much as they want. And it isn't and bound you, by and, a channel. And so putting streaming aside, because it's sort of a component, I guess, is how do you think about the kind of the media, um, uh, the, the universe of media opportunities? How do you, do you distinguish? Do you approach them differently? Um, could you maybe flesh that out a little bit? Yeah, so we cover lots, you know, the, um, I should say this at the top, media isn't, um, you know, a, an industry, it's some monolithic vertical. There are so many subsectors and figuring them out is actually what we're paid to do because some are in decline, some are just low growth and others are really compelling. Mm -hmm. uh, and at Providence, we've always had to shift our focus to look ahead. I've always thought we need to be, if I have to learn or my partners have to learn about a, a vertical by reading about it, well, that's too late. We need to be, and, and this is the challenge and what I love to, we, we need to see around the corner and, and get there either before others or before it's appreciated. That's really important. Right. Um, and it's a, all the stuff we used to do. In the, we, we, yes, we still are doing some of it like mobile. We're still investing in Europe. But in the US, it's a, it's, um, it's a big company game and not much opportunity for private equity. Not true in Europe. And we've, done, we've been way more active there, even though we started in the US. 
Um, I'd say, well, streaming, yeah, we played a big role with Hulu from mm -hmm. day one. Uh, but today it is, uh, if you don't have content, which is why I like Disney's position, Netflix, because they, their scale, um, HBO, they've got content. Peacock is a hybrid. They've got content and they've got a great um, access point because they're a cable company too. So um, we, instead of shifted to services, software and services around uh, media. One of our portfolio companies very recently went public, double verify. What they do is they do something that for digital advertisers that the main network uh, uh, platforms, Facebook, Google, can't do for themselves, which is measure. The measure, is it being viewed by a bot or a person? Mm -hmm. A lot of bots watching TV. The problem is bots don't buy anything. So it's a wasted ad. And right. figuring that out is non-trivial and measured in billions of spots um, uh, that you've got to figure out very quickly. Who's what? It, um, and the second thing they do, they do um, is what is called brand safety, making sure that a, a spot that Disney bought on YouTube is not adjacent to some content that they might consider brand harming. They need to get that off and get it off fast. Right. And they need an independent party to do that. And Double Verify does that better than anyone. So that's an idea of like what we're doing today that's different. And would that be what you would view as what's around the corner? Is 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 that um, if if you have somebody ask you specifically, what's your highest conviction of thematically of what's kind of coming around the corner uh, in the in the sandboxes in which you play? What would you say? Yeah, no, I think that um, that's a great example. It's a service. It's based on um, software. There's a data element to it. Um, there is a positioning of the company in the ecosystem that they can do something that some incumbents cannot or some that you might think likely. Um, and it's very high growth. That's what we're looking for. We're, we're not as good generally on low growth companies. Um, it happens to be a lot more fun to invest in growth companies, but it's also a lot more profitable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Especially and in this environment. And so, and let me come back. I mean, I remember uh, hearing you talk maybe a year uh, and a half ago, right before COVID, and you were at the time, you know, quite passionate about music and sports, and and you've historically been a very meaningful investor in live entertainment, especially you know sporting events. How has the pandemic and lockdowns um, impacted your views on that? Um, it's reaffirmed for me their place in, um, in community, in entertainment, in value, um, sports. I mean, even to, as we are speaking now, there is still so much attention on sports. When will fans be back? Um, we saw recently the uphill, upheaval is the kindest way to put it uh, to a proposal on the Super League which in our name had been connected with it because we had done some early work and then uh, dropped out. Um, that's passion. I mean, you have people protesting. Hmm. Not, not, we're used to protests about some very serious social issues and political issues, but these were protests around uh, the formation of a soccer, of a, of a European football league. Yeah. High passion. Now, to me, as an investor, uh, while it's um, it, it underscores how valuable franchises are in certain leagues, because and, and the and and the whole economy that comes with it, because these are it's a large group measured in millions, typically very passionate. They're not going to do without it. So. 
what I love about that is that's enduring. I mean, uh, and there are huge entry barriers. There's giant moats around those businesses. You can say, well, okay, that's a great business. I'll go create a team. Good luck. You right. But you're not concerned about reduced viewership and reduced engagement in the, you know, we've seen that in the NBA, we've seen that in MLB. Like that doesn't, con that's... Um... No, I think you have to look through the number. First of all, I, I'm actually impressed how they've held up. Uh, better than one would have guessed. Um, I've always thought that the TV experience is enhanced by uh, audience presence at the game that even though the big money is in the media rights, as opposed to game day revenues on site, mm -hmm. um, it's still really important because you can't have no one at a game and expect viewership. It diminishes the experience. Right. Great example is baseball. We see many parks um, in North America where the attendance isn't great. Well, why would you expect people to watch something on TV if, if people aren't even bothering to go? Right. And on the other hand, when you watch a Yankees game, a Red Sox game, the Do Dodgers, only if they're good, people will go, which tells you something about that market is maybe a little fickle in that market. It, it really matters. But so you've got to improve the game day experience because that's vital to keep the big, you know, the bucks that and ratings that you were referencing. So I think the numbers have held up well. Um, American football has done, I think, very well. Um, and especially in, in, in this environment. Um, and I don't see anything like it to compete on ratings wise. So it can, it can slip, but on a relative basis, it's done really well. You saw the 10 year deal that the NFL just signed with their um, media right partners uh, immediate rights um, at significant increases going out very long. I think it was a very smart deal for the NFL. Gives them time to sort out streaming and other forms of distribution um, at attractive rates. Good for them. And right. I would expect that to be true of the NBA and, and other leagues. Okay. Very interesting. So let me, let me zone out a little bit and just come back to like the, the macro environment in which and how you think about the macro environment today, what you're paying attention to or risks you're most concerned about and perhaps even threats that most investors are not giving enough attention to. Hmm. Um, well, we cannot influence the macro environment. We do think about it. I think about it a lot, mostly, well, not much, in part because when I meet with investors, they always, they ask me, uh, what do you think? Even when I tell them, I don't know, and most people don't know, or maybe no one knows. And, that, and I think they want to know even more once you say that. But <laughs> So a couple of things. And I talk about this at our annual meeting. It's usually the first piece when I talk about macroeconomics, um, which is probably more family offices care because they're allocating not just to private equity, but they're, they care about markets generally. Um, and I'd say number one, and as I said, I talked about this in the last meeting, our annual meeting, uh, actually beginning two years ago, was government intervention in uh, uh, our macro economy on a level we've never seen before. We had a decade of, it was all about monetary policy that, and, and in particular, Expansionary monetary policy we've never seen before. That was all that, because that's that was the one of two levers that governments had, and that was the only one they were using. So it was all about near zero uh, rates. I say near zero, not just because it was slightly positive, but a lot of sovereign wealth that was a negative yield on issuance. And there isn't. I studied economics. There wasn't a single textbook when I was studying economics that talked about negative rates. Um, uh, so I think that, that this great experiment has yet to run its course um, and how we move from, and it has distorted asset pricing in particular financial assets. Um, at some point, 
Maybe when that's why inflation is so relevant today. When rates move up, we're going to get a, a, a shift. Now that's well known. The piece that I was talking about, because that's what most of us talked about for 10 years, but beginning a few years ago was um, helicopter money. I first mentioned it, people said, what are you talking about? Well, this was a jump start to getting back into fiscal policy, became an expansionary policy, the likes of which is actually rare, somewhere between unprecedented, depending on the country, and rare, which is direct injection of money in consumers' hands, right into their bank account. When I said that, people said, oh, that's silly. That's what's happening. Now, I'm not saying Pete, that it's unwise to help. In fact, it's a good thing to help people who, who, uh, who need the help. Um, and many who are getting checks don't, and probably there are others who aren't getting enough. But it's going on an unprecedented level at a time where we're going to layer on other giant multi-trillion dollar expenses on top of deficits that no one is really seriously considering the ramifications. So I worry about the, the government intervention, not just the scale of the debt and deficits, but the distortion that happens in an economy when that happens. I'm a believer in the role of government. I'm a believer in helping people. I'm a believer in doing things that private industry cannot. Um, but I also am a believer in private driving growth through um, private enterprise. And this intervention at this scale, we have never seen it in peacetime. And, and, and so what implications does that have? So therefore, what does that mean for your investment strategy? And if, if at the you know, what does that actually so, mean? So I think for us, two things. One is we pay really close attention, attention to downside scenarios. What if this doesn't go right? What if we can't pass through price increases? What if we don't grow at this rate? What if a competitor makes a move? All those scenarios, we spend a lot for, for a firm that's focused on growth. If you sat through our lengthy investment committee meetings, I sit through every one as chair, um, we spend a lot of time on what can go wrong. So, um, so that's number one. Number two is we look at how we can actually grow a business. What are the levers? What are the levers we control? And anything that it, now to some degree, we're all dependent on the economy, but the sensitivity of, of that varies by business. And we want to be an essential service. We, you asked about sports. I love sports because it seems to be independent. People are going to, well, they may even watch more when, they're, when they have time for not a good reason. But, um, and that's why mobile is such a great play. Because it's an essential. You can't go without it. Mm -hmm. There was a time when people didn't believe that. So uh, I... And for me, I think fixed income, I, we, we started a credit business. It did really well. We grew it to about 25 billion in assets under management. Um, we sold most of it. Uh, I think it's a, it, it, it worked out well for us. It's a much thinner margin business, but in general, I'm an equity, we're, we're an equity firm and I'm an equity guy. Right. I'm glad I didn't choose credit a long time, not because it just it was a better fit. I, growing companies is much more fun to talk about and also is the best antidote to a world when multiples contract. If you have grown a business, you can fight that the current that might be going the other way, which is multiple contraction. Right. And let me ask you, just uh, because we have, again, we're speaking to family offices and ultra high net worth investors. Um, I guess everybody would be curious how you invest your own capital. I mean, uh, yes, we know how Providence invests capital. How, how do you uh, allocate your own? So, I'll be completely transparent about it. For most of my career, I spent no time on it. I just parked it in riskless securities. And um, the money managers I hired, their only frustration was that they couldn't, didn't, couldn't talk to me because I didn't have time. Right. Uh, bored by it. Now, if you're an investor in our 
fund, you'd say, perfect, I don't want you spending time on that. Just focus on the money you manage. Yeah. And then at some point, beginning about, um, I don't know exactly when, it seemed irresponsible. I was giving up too much just to have it in something like cash. Um, so, uh, and a lot had been given, you know, irrevocably to a family foundation and the rest when I'm gone entirely. Hmm. Um, so why well, I say entirely 95% wow. goes to, uh, philanthropic, um, causes irrevocably. So, um, then I started thinking about the same things that family offices and endowments, and I did sit on a few endowment boards um, with a more meaningful and, and traditional asset allocation. I started doing that. But I have to tell you, I am very light in fixed income, um, heavy in private equity, um, and growth. And I've always kept. Um, a, a, you know, from my old days, say 10% in just cash. And, and it actually came in handy about a year ago. And they said, this is time, this is, I've been waiting for a rainy day. If I don't act now, what's the point of having it? Right, right, right. Uh, and, um, and I want to come back because you're leaving 95% of your uh, wealth to charity. I want to come back to that in a second. But there's one thing that I've been meaning to ask you earlier and I just couldn't get to is, you know, I, I'm curious about the culture that you've created at Providence. And particularly when you think about the traits that you look for in people, the traits that you try to cultivate in your people, and perhaps even the values you try to cultivate in yourself or try to exemplify, how would you, how would you characterize that? Well, I think from day one, we've always, uh, as I said, I said at the top, it was about culture was one of the reasons to start a province. That's still true today. We, we, we spend so much time with one another. I was like, it, it, you need to respect each other, like each other. Um, just because of the time and the, it, that we spend with one another and the collaborative nature of our work. It takes a team to do all the things I talked about. So, um, so it's team sport and it doesn't work unless you act as a team that's internally, externally. I think you have to treat people as a golden rule as you would want to be treated. And not everyone who manages money does that. And, it, it, and I'm not just talking about private equity, just generally. And, um, it started a long time ago with that first one, that first fund, we were so small and I, I felt like it's the smallest fund in the world. And if we didn't treat CEOs well, why on earth would they ever work with us? Right. Uh, because we were the, the new group and the smaller group and the unknown group. And I think it's important to still act that way. And not, mm -hmm. not for show, I mean, to really believe it, that first of all, entrepreneurs that we need to choose us to work with, they have to like us, believe that we can add value. So that's an expertise, but want to spend time with us, need to trust us. It's a partnership in the fullest meaning of the word. It's so what works for us internally actually works for us externally equally well. Right. That people respond to, um, People they think are know what they're doing and are good guys. And when I say good guys, it's men and women. And uh, I, for us, it was a necessity, but it also felt right, and it was a lot more comfortable and fun. Now, right. to do that, you have to stay on it consistently. Anytime someone gets kind of out of bounds, you know, we have nearly two hundred people. You have to coach them. You have to help them. Feedback, yeah. and that's what we do. So we work on it. I think we're known and appropriately for being a good place to work. Good people, and so that's really important. Yeah, and it's probably a good segue back to the philanthropic side of things. So, 
again, you're giving away 95% of your capital. And I, I think you've kind of made that public. You've been a signatory to, you know, Buffett's and Gates uh, giving pledge. And you've also made a whole bunch of transformational gifts to your alma mater and, uh, and so on. Maybe talk to us a little bit about your unique approach or philosophy. I mean, you, you we're talking, ultimately, you'll be giving away billions of dollars. How, how, how are you thinking about yeah, so it? Two, two things, by the way, because people who are familiar with the giving pledge might say, wait a minute, that's 50% and it's not ironclad. And they're right. So where did 95 and where did Irrevocable come from? Well, when Bill Gates reached out to me, my hang up was, I don't, uh, I'm scared of the public aspect of it. The, the, the commitment is, I said, I've actually already done that. This is gone. This is, you know, in our, their legal documents, it goes to a foundation and they can't reverse that. That's that. Right. So, um, uh, and then the more I thought about it, I said, okay, really what we need, if I can influence someone else to give that's in a similar circumstance, um, that would be a good thing. And I also think it's one of the traditions in the US that to be celebrated, Canada too, which is philanthropy at every level, not just the conspicuous large numbers at every level. And I love that. Now, for me, I was focused on areas that where I thought for some reason there is a hole in the system. So, for example, basic research, the kind of research that is um, led to in the work prior to the pandemic for science that became the foundation fundamentally of vaccines that's saving all of us, I believe. Um, and th that led me to Rockefeller because they were doing, in that case, it was biomed work, luring talent, identifying and then attracting talented researchers that were capable in their view of developing uh, game-changing kind of leapfrogs in understanding, not eking out another 2% of effectiveness of a medicine. That's applied research. We have plenty of companies who are doing that. Right. They didn't need my help, for sure. But fundamental research of the kind that Bell Labs used to do and other entities, that has actually, and the government supports, that's actually been under a lot of pressure to show immediate results, as opposed to going to um, uh, a uh, researcher talking about cancer and the big question they want to solve and giving them 14 years to work on it without, you know, proving tenure or whatever along the way. Right. That's really important, I think, fundamentally. I think about everything that came out of Bell Labs. Somebody's got to be doing basic research, not applied, basic. Yeah. Um, so that led me there. I believe in. Um, the power of education. It was what I got out of my family experience, and and you know was that impressed me to have the value of that combined with hard work. So I think that universities in the U.S. That by the way, some of that is research, sure. are uh, are world class. So I want to support that. Right. Um, and Institute for Advanced Study is the pursuit of. Gen of uh, as one of the founders said, the pursuit of useless knowledge. Well, it's not that that's obviously not the case. This is some of the great discoveries. This was Einstein's home when he came to the US. So, um, and then quietly some other initiatives. Uh, I think it's very important to give back that when we're all done, did we make a positive contribution? And that's not a person, that's not about one's family, no one, no one should care about, they, they should, except for the family members, arguably. Yeah. but no, what have you done for however you define your community? It could be small, which I think is important. It could be the city or town you live in, it could be national, it could be global, it could be a combination depending on your reach and interests. And that's, I know my dad, isn't, he, he's not alive, but he would say, Okay, it's great you've done well, but what have you done for others? Mm -hmm. And 
yeah, so that's, that's driving me. Right, right. I, and uh, I think, Jonathan, first of all, kudos for all that you have done for uh, the organizations you mentioned and for society more broadly and the innovation you brought to the, to the market. We didn't even get a chance to talk about some of the ESG innovations that you kind of brought to bear, but really, um, uh, I wish we weren't out of time, but th this was just fantastic. I mean, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for joining, for um, sharing your incredible insights and, and uh, the generosity of time and wisdom you afforded us. And we really hope we can do this again soon. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's actually been a pleasure. I'm delighted it's going to a, a good cause. And if you end up with a, a career in, uh, or another career um, as an interviewer on television, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. This, <laughs> this, this hour flew by and uh, it was a pleasure talking to you and covering these topics. So thank you. Thank you, thank you again. And really for all our participants, thank you for joining us. If you haven't yet donated, please do so on the donate page at the top right of the site so that we can continue supporting uh, and strengthening pediatric mental health in our communities. Jonathan, thanks again for supporting Lunches with Legends. We are grateful to each and every one of you and wish everyone a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Music